If you're a child of God, let's hear it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God.
Matthew chapter 24, we've gotten to see what uh, these disciples wanted to understand what the end was going to look like. And what they, they should be expecting towards the end of days, as, as many of us want to do. Uh, and what I believe that this book has been telling us is it's a, a warnings. There's a bunch of warnings. As you can see the slide, don't uh, ignore the warning. We live around warnings every single day, don't we? You know, for, for me growing up in a Hispanic uh, household, my mom had a bunch of warnings. Don't eat Good. Don't put too much sugar in your coffee. Don't drink uh, soft drinks. There was so many other things, but we have warnings every day. How many have ever got pulled over by a police officer and got a warning? What if you continue to speed? You'll get a ticket. So there's warnings of to-dos and not to-dos. Why don't we drink poison? Eh, it's probably not good for you. The, that warning label on there says it's not a suggestion. You know what I mean? So we live around every single day uh, around warnings. But we have to decide in our own mind whether we're going to choose to live by the warning or ignore it, right? We have to choose that. What we're going to do with the warning. There's different warnings. If you do this, this is the result. We have to choose whether we're going to uh, abide by them or discount them because eventually that's going to happen. You know, when we get a warning light on that says the oil light in our dash, it says oil light, you're low on oil. Should we ignore it? You could, and then eventually you'll be calling someone and it's not going to be good. So we, we just get to see those types of things. But as we've been going through this passages or this passage here in Matthew 24, we've been given many warnings. How to be prepared for the things that are going to take place in the last days. Are we prepared for that? What does it look like? You know, how many believe we're living in those times now? I believe we're living towards the end because of what scripture tells us and what's going on in this world. We're coming to that hedge point. We're coming to that point of we're getting to see it happen in our days. But what's important to us here is that God has indicated already. We don't know the time or the hour that's going to happen. We don't know when he's going to come back. We've been talking about the, the second coming, but what about the rapture of the church? What is that? We'll say, what is the rapture of the church? That's when we here as believers will be caught up in the clouds with him. We'll be taken away, and then it's going to be a tribulation period. Here on earth, it'll be destroyed. All the stuff in here. And that's, that's what we're waiting for, is to hear that trumpet shout and saying, hey, we're going to live with him, the promise that he's given us. So that's what we should be preparing for. Many try to predict this time. Have you ever heard people try to predict when he's going to come? You can look at YouTube, and they have a bunch of hits. And they're like, dude, you're out of your mind, because it says not even the angels know it's going to be the time of that. So we don't know. But so far, we've learned lessons from this particular chapter. We got to see lessons from a fig tree. He says, I'm going to show you a lesson from a fig tree. In verse 32, he says, as soon as the branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. You know that he's coming close if we're getting to see some of the times unfold as he's told us about here. Next, we had a lesson from the times of Noah, if you remember. In verse 38, he says, For as those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. You know, these people were partying. They were doing all their stuff in the days of Noah. Although they were warned, they were caught unaware. Said, we didn't know when he was coming. We didn't know when this flood was coming. And it swept them away. <clears throat> then we learned a lesson from a thief, if you remember last time. He says in verse 43, But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming... He would have stayed awake and would not let have his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's the thing that's supposed to prepare us because we don't know when it's going to happen. It's just so many different things happen on a daily basis that we don't know when they're going to happen. What's going to happen, right? We don't know when we're going to have a flat. We don't know when we're going to run late. We don't know anything about what happens tomorrow, do we? You know, as I do, probably as you do, have spent much 
Money unlocks alarms, weapons, big burly dogs, but not the thief that's about to come, Jesus. We spend and put our attention on these other things to try to keep our home safe, to keep us safe. But what about when he comes? Are we ready for that? That's what we should be preparing for. So if we looked at all these different passages that we just went over, what are they telling us? We're going to be prepared. That's what we need to look for. In Proverbs 8.34, it tells us, Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting besides my doors. That's the ones that are prepared, always looking, ready for him to come. Those who wait, let me share with you this, those who wait to become prepared are playing a dangerous game. Have you ever heard of this game called Russian Roulette? Who would ever play Russian roulette? Maybe some of you have. You guys are crazy. So when people are doing this and they're not preparing for his coming, with each passing day, you're hearing a tick of that hammer closing because you're not prepared. And that's a scary thing. Those of us, there's some of us here, out there, that still think we have time to get it right. The deathbed conversion, we've heard of those. But I'll, I'll eventually get to it. I'll commit my life to the Lord when it's time. When's that time? When are we going to wait? Do we know when that day will come? Well, what if you leave before he comes? What if we're called home before he comes? We talked about that last time, uh, about when do we know we're going to get in an accident? I was reading an article this week, and this uh, people were in Kentucky, and they were pulling in, and they parked next to this parking space and said, hey, we're at Denny's. We're going to get down and have some pancakes. I don't know what they were going to eat, but they parked there. And all of a sudden, this sign over 100 feet in the air came down and smashed the car. <laughs> there was three of them in there. One of them went home, well, wherever they were went, went, I call it home, but wherever the resting place was going to be, two survived. But what were they expecting? Pancakes? Who thought that that would happen? I just want to share with you uh, a couple of things to see. Uh, there's a couple of different pictures I have of that. That's, it was on the top, top of that. And you can see it on top of the car at the bottom. Let me show the next slide. Were they expecting that? Who's expecting that? That's why I say, is we, were, we, were they ready? We must be ready because we don't know whenever this is going to happen. He says, be prepared all the time to meet me. We don't ever want to be like, I'm going to be thinking about death and horror and stuff like that. But are we ready to say, hey, if I died today, I'm ready to see him. I don't have nothing to hide. That's how we got to live. There's a, uh, Andrew Murray once said, there's a, there is such a danger of our being so occupied with the things that are to come more than with him who is to come. Think about it. We're so sometimes consumed by the things around us rather than the things that are to come, to them, him to come. I get so caught up sometimes in my day that I forget about everything else. I know some of you do the same thing. I get preoccupied just with busyness and I forget everything else. There's been times in my life that I get up, don't pray, don't read, and I just go along my day. And I'm like, wow, I feel weird today. I feel empty. And I know why. So as we move on this morning, we're going to learn some lessons from some servants. Um, there's a couple of servants. There's a wise servant and there's an evil servant. So I want to share with you the cast in this story, who it's you and I, servants or employees. Jesus is the master or the boss in the story. 
in the household here that we'll be talking about is the world, the world in which we live. Uh, let's read our passage together. It's going to be from vor- verses 45 to uh, 51. And then we'll come back to it. It begins with, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at a proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master's delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know. And he will cut him into pieces and put him in with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Pretty heavy duty there. But I want to begin by looking at the wise servant. We'll look at each one and see what they look like. But let's look at the verse, uh, verse 45 and 46, where it begins with this wise servant. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant that is the servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. You know, when the Lord left heaven, he left some instruction not only for them, but for us. Because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here today learning about it today. He left us work to do. And you're like, well, what work is that? So I was looking over that this week. It's like, what did you leave me here to do? What work is there to do? Well, it's not about works. It's about service to him. Okay, so we got to get that right. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. There was things that he planned for us to do. And what are those things? Like, eh, is, is there like an ABC book in here? What do we need to do? One of them, and which is a greatest one, is the Great Commission. It's not a suggestion, as I mentioned to you. It's a command. If you look at this, it's a command that you and I are supposed to fulfill. In Matthew 28, 9, 18 through 20, it says this. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's very vital. The reason I say that, it says, go make disciples. Well, how do we go? Do we have a class? How do we make disciples? It's living amongst each other, sharing with one another, encouraging one another. You don't have to live that way. There's a better way to live. Those, it says those, when we find someone erring, those who are spiritual, talks about that in Galatian, I mean, in Ephesians. Those who are spiritual, go and help that brother out when they're struggling. Lest, it says, be careful lest you fall into it yourself. He's, he, he tells us that. But some people, how do I do this? Teach them what you know. That's what the thing is. It's vital for us to keep understanding the word of God and knowing what he wants for us. Then you can share that with others when they're struggling. Hey, I was struggling in alcoholism. What did you do to get out of it? Well, I have the answer because I went through that. This is what I did. And this will help me out of that. And it's, the, the, the board is broad on how we can help others. But we must be learning ourselves. What does that look like? You know what this, this message brings? This message is to be brought to broken people. Has everybody been broken here? I'm not saying broken. Broken spiritually where you don't know that there's, if I can face tomorrow those deep depression, those dark days that you and I have had, that's what we need to bring this message of this. Everything broken can be fixed through Jesus Christ. Everything. Everything ruined can be restored through Christ Jesus. (laughs) I I, I, I just love what God does. He takes ashes and messed up things. He makes beauty out of them. I can see what a wreck my life was. Some of you, you know what a wreck your life was. And what God has done has been a miracle. 
He also said this in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Another thing we must do. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. We look at that, loving him with everything that we have. Does our life display that? Does it look like that? And I was talking with my brother this morning in, in my office, and I was saying, can we come upon someone and know that they are in love with Christ? You should be able to, so you're excited about it. They're excited to want to share and want to see what God has done in their lives. That's what you're excited because of what God has done, and yet still working. That's the transformation that we can boast about and say, wow, God, we boast about you because what you've done. But we are called to live in diligence till he comes back. He says, how will I find you living when I come back? When that trumpet comes, how will you be? What situation will you have your life in when I come back? Think about that for yourselves. I've thought about it often. How will he find me when he comes back? Living for him or will I be attached to this world? Which one is greater in my life? Which one takes most of my time? It's easy to distinguish. Our true master is the one we love, the one we spend time with. He says that we can't serve two masters. You're going to be devoted to one and not the other. So we got to choose this day who we're going to serve. You know what I mean? Our hearts can be divided. And when we're hearts divided like that, that means, means we're lukewarm. We love the world and we love God. Then we're lukewarm. We're playing the fence game. So he says that we're supposed to be doing these things. How many parents do I have in here this morning? Okay, let me share with you this. As a parent, how do you feel when you left things for your kids to do before you got home and when you arrived, they're not done? Can we put an angry emoji up there? <laughs> Think about it. You say, what happened? I left you this list of things to do. And you slacked off. Something. So looking at that, the Lord expects us to be faithful while he's gone and be working when he returns. If he's left of these things to do, then are we doing them? Or are we waiting for another day? I know we live in the land of manana. We'll do it tomorrow. I got to, there's so many other things. I could fill my, my days with things to do. But once I get my, what I need to do is what's most important first. And then all those things will come second. You know, I think this is, should spur us on to live uh, holy lives and be actively involved in service and sharing our faith. When well, we're connected to something, serving, serving the Lord with all your heart, what are you doing? How are we serving him? Living, sharing our faith. Look at what God has done in my life. Sometimes we can become embarrassed. What are they going to say? It really doesn't matter because when you stand before the Lord, you have to give an account of yourself, not them. I was embarrassed to say, let it go. Let it go. The more you start to do it, the easier it becomes. But in, unless you start to say it, you'll never say it. You'll never encourage anyone. You know, the Lord took initiative to pull us from our former lifestyles. I'll take you out. He saved us. He cleansed us and set us apart for his purpose. That's what he did. Why did he do this, though? You must understand, why did he pull us out of the mess that we were in? Cleansed us, set us apart. So others could see the work displayed in us. Say, there is a God because I knew who you were. And God, this is a miracle because you're not who you once were. But if we live like everyone else, there will no be a display of Christ in our lives. You look like everyone else. 
Why would anybody want to come to Christ if we look like and talk like everybody else? We're supposed to be set apart for him. Not just lip service. I say everybody could say, oh, I believe. But you could see it through the actions that they really don't believe. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul talking to the Corinthian church, he says this. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We're his representatives. We're supposed to be speaking, come to the Lord. But the question is often, why should I come? There's got to be a display in your life that your life has changed. If not, nobody usually believes you. People will see the change and people see what God has done. But we must ask the question, if we're ambassador, if we are an ambassador for Christ, what are we telling others? By our lives, by our actions. Are we drawing closer to him? Or we still look the same? You know, I think that that's a problem with so many in the faith today and even in churches that call there's even at, at some of these big stadium things they call so many people to Christ to accept Christ right you just need to believe yes Romans 10 9 and 10 believe with all your heart okay then what after that there's a part that's missing from that is continuing to live as he says uh, teach him all that I have commanded you that they would walk in them There's another piece to it. It's just not simply, it's walking the walk, talking the talk, changing the life that Christ has changed. And I'm I'm not telling you here that it happens overnight. Some of us have been in the faith for a long time. And still I have questions. I'm just kidding. But I'm God, I'm I'm thankful that God is slow. He's long-suffering. He's giving me a chance to get my life together, to give my life to him. And it's taken little by little. At first, I didn't know, how am I going to give my life to him? I got so many things to do. It was little by little that he guided me through. It was little by little that I put those other things secondary and put him first. But there's a reward for this. He says in, in verse 47, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. You know, this being obedient in his service will give us greater service. You know, we have, you guys know I have a company. And when we see someone prospering and, you know, they do well, they work great. We look at that person closely because he's taken initiative. He wants to go. We usually raise him up and put him over many other things and with the pay. We get, we bless him in that way, that particular individual. And that's what God says. If you're obedient, I'm going to, I'm going to blow your mind with what I'll use you for. But we'll never see that unless we're working towards that. May I share this with you? A servant's task is not to be popular, but to be obedient. It's not to be popular. I don't want to be the popular pastor. I don't want to be the popular follower. I don't want to, I want to be obedient first. Let's look on the other side of this. Let's look at the evil servant. It's 48 through 51. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master's delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him in an hour he does not know and will cut him to pieces and put him in, put him with the hypocrites in the place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever heard this, this uh, saying when the cats away, the mice will play. Oftentimes when we allow time to pass, people begin to get lazy in their walks. 
Think about it. For some, when you worked, some of you retired, but when you work, some of you do work. When you first got the job, you worked your hardest to try to impress. You did whatever. You went above and beyond. But as time has went on, it started to decrease. You did less. You did less fervor for the job, and it dwindled. And that's the way some of our walks can be. At first, you're excited. I remember when I first got saved, I wanted to tell everybody, the waitress, the gas, the people at the gas station, I was leaving tracks everywhere. And I, I stop and I'm thinking, am I still doing that? Am I still excited like that? Because God's saving grace. Sadly, there's going to be those like this in the house of God. They were excited when they started but then begin to live as his plane, as if his plane were delayed, like he's taking a long time. It reminded me, as I, I went over this passage this week, it reminded me of a song that you probably all know and you've heard, and there's been different renditions for different bands that have played this. this the, the song is the sound of silence. You remember that song, you've heard it. Its lyrics are quite stunning if you listen to the lyrics. And actually, it's, it's like a revelation if you listen to that song now, The Sound of Silence. But the first beginning part of this lyrics, it says this, and it was striking to me. It says, hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly creeping left its seed while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Think about what that looks like. When we become comfortable and complacent in our walks, we sometimes go back to those old friends. The friends brought the darkness. Those things in our lives, I'm not just talking about friends. Those old friends could be different things in our lives that held us to where we were. Hello, darkness, my old friend. It shouldn't be no friend at all. That's what got you in the shape that you were in. That's something, that darkness is what Jesus rescued us from. For us to go be visiting once again in the darkness is wrong. I want you something else that I want you to notice is this was someone in service to God. This was called a servant here. This should be, wake us from our slumber because he's talking about someone in service to the Lord. Someone that was supposedly supposed to be seeking and following after the Lord. This is not just a churchgoer or an unbeliever, but a servant. Someone involved. But sometimes we ignore the warnings. To ignore this warning of his coming is to invite disaster. To ignore this warning of his coming is to invite disaster. What is this disaster? I will cut him into pieces and put him with the hypocrites in the place where we'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look, if you think about this, he says, I will cut him into pieces and I don't know what that looks like, but it doesn't sound good. And he puts him with the hypocrites. We learned what the hypocrite was. Those were stage actors that played the part. They played the part with their beliefs and say, I believe. But their actions showed otherwise that they truly didn't believe. Sadly, many will continue to live as there's no consequences to come. They'll live their life continually like that. Billy Graham once said, the sub subject of the second coming of Christ has never been popular to any but the true believer. That's who it's popular to. The true believer, us that want to go home, that's important to us. It's not a very popular message because sometimes we're so ingrained. Can I tell you, this life and the world and everything has its fun. I have fun. I can do different things, but some of that fun can overtake me. Yeah. 
So as I'm sharing this with you this morning, does that mean that we're supposed to have stop having fun? You can't watch football games. You can't do anything. You can't watch PG-13 movies. Does that mean that? No. What we must learn how to do is to live with the friction between readiness for Jesus' return and planning for generations to come. Let me put it to you this way. If you knew Jesus was coming back now in February, let's say you knew a date, an hour, Jesus was coming back in February, what would you have to do? What would you do to change? What would in your life would have to change? If you knew he was coming back in February, what would you change in your life before he came? Is there something that needed to change? Or would you continue to live as you're living? That's how we're supposed to live in readiness. Expecting him at any time. So if there's things that has to change, I need to change them now. That's the way I'm supposed to live. In readiness. There was a quote from Abraham Lincoln, and he said this. I thought it was pretty good. He says, to be well prepared is important in so much of life. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my axe. How are you going to chop down a tree with a dull axe? I'd rather be sharp. We prepare for many things, right? We prepare for tests. Our career, we study. We buy insurance for our cars in case of a car accident. We buy house insurance in case something happens in the house, right? We even prepare for the end of our lives by making wills. We prepare for all those things. The Bible tells us we must prepare ourselves spiritually also to be ready for that time. The great revivalist Vance Havner once said this. He says, we are not just looking for something to happen. We are looking for someone to come. And when these things begin to pass, come to pass, we are not to drop our heads in discouragement or shake our heads in in despair, but rather lift up our heads in delight. It's exciting for me to see the times that we're living in because I know the time is drawing near. I don't have to deal with this anymore. And if you take a glimpse at what heaven's going to be like, people say, oh, I'm going to leave this place and all the fun and all this stuff. Really? You don't know what's prepared for us up there. Those of you that hurt and have pain this morning, there won't be none. Those of you that are depressed, sad, there will not be any. There's going to be joy. We're going to be to eat all the tamales, chicharrones that we want. We won't get fat. (laughs) pie chocolate cake I want to eat it every day there won't be no love handles on this bad boy (laughs) I love that and we're not going to be sitting on on a cloud playing harps there's going to be different things it's going to be like as we are without the evil that exists can you imagine a life living in a life like this where there's no hate for one another Everybody cares for one another. You don't have to go pay for anything. Everything's free. That's what I like. Let me have a dozen tacos. (laughs) Gratis. I'm always thinking about food. I'm sorry. Make everybody hungry. (laughs) I'm just waiting for that taco bar. It's like, man, that spread. I was going to say something else, but Lord. (laughs) Luke 21, 28 tells us, now when these things begin to take place, strengthen up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Raise up your heads. Your redemption is drawing near. That's where we're headed. Not to a place here. You know, our readiness will be rewarded. Matthew 25, 21 tells us, the master was full of praise. 
He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now we'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. But I want you to, as I always bring up, he says, well done. He didn't say, well said. There had to have been action been taken there. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Not well said. You and I are called to responsibility to share what God has done in our lives. But you cannot take someone where you're not already going. But what does it mean to live ready? What does it look like? How can we prepare ourselves for his arrival? Is it just coming to church? What is it that we're looking for? What does it mean to be ready for Christ's return? We can ask ourselves here, and I'll ask you now, uh, are we ready? But we can be ready. Let me share with you this little thing, because I remember those of you that have had children, women, just give you a little thing. I remember a time when Sam and I were getting close to her first pregnancy with my son, Alex. We didn't know the exact time when he was going to come. But we always did certain things to prepare for that day, to make sure we were ready whenever the time came. We probably weren't traveling. Uh, there was different things that we put in place. We would have a go bag in the trunk of the car or by the door or with things that we needed. We knew that they needed at the hospital. You go out there with no gown. You, they give you that old gown that everything's showing in the back. You know what I mean? You take some clothes. Everybody knows that. Everybody laughs because that's like, after this many years, you can't come up with a better solution? Que va? Like, let's, something that covers me. <laughs> Give me a schmedium. I'm a big guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry. But we always prepared for the stay at the hospital. We had it all planned out, even to where we would park the car so it would be easy access to the hospital. We planned it all out, as many of you did when you had your children. You planned it out. You just didn't say, oh, it's going to happen. What's going to happen? You knew what was going to happen. When you started with the Braxton Hicks, then you went into labor, and it got to work like, oh, those types of things. You knew it was coming. You prepare for it. 2 Peter 3, verse 14 tells us, And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. Where will we be found when he comes? Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 also tell us, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This is the time to encourage each other. You can do it, bro. You can do it, sis. There's a lot of different things. We struggle with different things. Each one of us struggles with something. We share with that. Uh, we talk about this many times in men's study, different studies, is that those things that we struggle with, when we share them with somebody, it's like they have no more control over you. The stuff that I wanted to deal with and I stay awake with all night, and I share it with my brother or sister in Christ, and then those things seem to have no power over me again or over a, a period of time. In 1 Corinthians 1558, it says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you, not know, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. It all counts. But unless we do it, we'll never know anything. You know, when, when I first got into ministry was years and years ago, I was taking my kids to kids' ministry. And uh, my pastor now, David, 
he grabbed me by the arm. He says, I think you'd be great back here doing kids ministry. And I'm like, me? I don't know nothing about this. I don't have no idea. And he says, just come, get involved. Just sit in there. I'll put you with somebody else and you can listen to see what's going on. And after a while, man, when I went in there, man, it sparked something in me. And I'm like, man, you should share with them this and you should share with them that. And I became excited of what God was doing in that classroom and seeing these little kids. And it's lit a fire within me. And little by little, God has moved me from ministry to ministry to ministry until this. I would never thought I would have been here. But until I got involved, I never would have known what God had for me until I got involved. I'm just so thankful God rescued me from where I was. When we live in expectancy awaiting his return, our diligent obedience becomes our main concern. When we live in expectancy, I'm waiting for him to return. Then our, our diligent obedience becomes our main concern. I want to be obedient. I want to be pleasing to him. Many of us have that relationship. He says that Christ and the church is those relationships as a husband and a wife. And I want to please my wife. And I know she wants to please me. I want to give her the best. She wants to give me the best. And it's, it's like that. And I get to see that so much in her. She serves me first. She gives me, when there's one little piece of meat, she'll give me the bigger half. And that's the way we ought to do, say, what can I give you my best? It's that sharing of ourselves with one another. But he's our main concern. But I want to close with this. I want to make it the question personal. Are you ready for his return? If you can honestly ask yourselves, am I ready for him to come back? I'm going to give you four things here that I'll share with you. Some questions. Number one, are you pursuing holiness and godliness? Not perfection, but progress. Is there any movement in, in your life? Holiness. People say, well, how do what I need to do? Buy a robe. What do I need to look like to be holy? Start getting involved. Start reading. Start praying. Start involving yourself within others' lives, within the church. Unlike myself, it wasn't until I got involved that I seen what God had for me. Number two, are you encouraging others by, and being built up by others? Are you connect, connected to the church community? Some of you have spent time at my home. Have you ever spent time with someone else in the church? How do we live this life? Because we all live together. We're going to spend eternity together. We get to know each other. Make time. Carve up time. Tell them you can come over as long as you bring the tacos. But I love to hang around. We, we all, a lot of us that hang around together. I'm no different than any one of you, if you guys know that. You guys have hung around with me. I have fun. I laugh. I carry on just like the rest of them. I'm a knucklehead. But I know the redeeming grace that God has brought in my life. Thirdly, are you persevering with confidence? Because even James tells us that we can be... Uh, uh, um, double-minded, unstable in all our ways. We believe one minute and say, I don't know if God's going to do it. Ah, you go back and forth. You go back and forth in the middle of the night sometimes. Is God real? Is God going to do anything? Does God hear me? Live in confidence that he is real and he is hearing. And it's going to be according to his time, his will, when things are going to happen. Our job is to be obedient and walk with him. He will do the changing so I said, oh, I got to change my life. I don't have to change it. He has to change it for me because I've tried to change it and it didn't work. You must allow God to change it. 
That's what's amazing about that. I don't have to do it. But sometimes we have to take our foot off the gas pedal in this life. Especially if like you're, if you're driven with me and Sam, you know what the gas pedal looks like. Lord, forgive us. We don't know what a speed limit sign looks like. But sometimes we go through life that fast and there's so much going on in our life, we don't stop and take time to listen to the Lord. What do you have for us, Lord? I can get into the habit, as I mentioned, sometimes we get in complacent and we become comfortable and lazy. And I don't want to read. I don't want to listen. I become lukewarm. Say, I'm good. I'm just going to coast along. I, be, I need to be pursuing every single day. I need to be ready, ready. You know, for those of you that have been married for a long time, hopefully you do this, that you still pursue your wife. You still pursue your husband. What happened that stopped you from doing that? God still pursues us. We should be pursuing each other with that love. Put the things away. Put away those past hurts and move on. Think about this. In what areas do you need to recommit to giving your, yourself fully to the work of the Lord? There's sometimes over time that we forget about the commitments and the things that we've given to the Lord, and we take them back. Say, Lord, I need to recommit myself. I remember Leonard Ravenhill once saying, he says, you're saved? You're saved from what? What did God save you from? Are you back doing those things? And number four, and there could be a lot of other ones. The last one is probably the most important one, and it should be the first one. Have you made the personal decision to trust in his work on the cross for your sins and follow him as your Lord and Savior. That's the most important thing. Many of us want to think, I need to clean up my life before I come to him. Has anybody ever thought about that? I need to clean up my life before I come to him. It's just the opposite. Come as you are. I'll do the cleaning. Because we'll, if we were up to do the cleaning, we would arrange it the way we wanted to arrange it. Has anybody cleaned their garage or their house but left the same amount of stuff in there? All you did is rearrange the junk. That's all you did. You didn't get rid of nothing. You just rearranged it. That's what I would do in my life. I'm just going to rearrange my junk. God will remove some of those areas that you need to get rid of. That's what's hampering you. Leonard, do you need to get rid of that? You spent all the time on that. So that's why I allow him to do that. But you must put him first and say, Lord, I need you. I need you to change me. I need you to rearrange me. I need you to remove the stuff in my life that I can't get rid of. <laughs> me and Sam have been on this purging thing and it feels so good. But there's sometimes, <laughs> if you've ever done this, you put all these items or she'll put all these items or I'll put all these items to the side and you're going through there like a garage sale. Oh, we could still keep this, and we could keep this, and then you have a bunch of Guerrero all over again. Get rid of it. We had pans this weekend. She was doing that, and she says, and I'm looking at the pans. Man, I really like that pan, you know? And it's just like, we have five other ones. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Let him get rid of what you need to get rid of. He knows what's best. There may be some of you here this morning that say, I've blown it. Well, I'm with you. I've made a mess of my life. You may be saying that same thing. I've made a mess of my life. Well, you're in good company because I believe everybody around you can say the same. If you knew, or knew us for who we really were, you wouldn't want to hang around with us. But God came in just the right time and he changed us from who we were to who we are. Thank you, Jesus. He 
heals the brokenhearted, the depressed, the hurting, the wounded. Anything that you can throw at him, he will make use out of it. It's not lost. The hope is not lost. Something else I want to say, he's not done. He's not done with us yet. We're not looking for perfection. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for progress. <laughs> As you guys have hung around with me, uh, I still don't have it together. But God is gracious and merciful towards me. He loves me that much. He's giving me a chance to make it right. As he says, he's given us a chance to repent, or what we would call it, change of direction. He chooses to help us change direction. If we're listening, if we want to change. If not, what are we waiting for? What are we going to wait to change? Why are we going to wait to change? Many of us, we've chose the hard knock school. It'll go down, let's wait till things just fall apart, then I'm going to turn. That's it's terrible. We ignored the warning. I pray this morning we take hold of this warning and began the preparations for his coming. They were ready. I just look at those poor folks wanting to get some pancakes and this sign falling on them. It's like, can you even believe? We, we don't think things like that would happen to us, but we're lying to ourselves when we think that way.
Your love 